Hey, welcome to church. Why don't we stand to our feet? Thank you for joining us online. We're going to worship. There's no place. 
if you agree with that heart's cry, would you just give it up to the God right now? Oh, Jesus. God, we are asking you by your spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Wow, changed lives. We're celebrating those today through water baptism. You Just what we've been praying, we see evidence of that right here today. So we have four in this service. We baptized eight in the first service. And we're just gonna be celebrating what happened when each of these people made this decision to follow Jesus. They're identifying with the fact that Jesus went to the cross and was buried. And as they go under the water, and then they come out of the water celebrating the resurrection power, which is what changes lives. So we're gonna rejoice together, yes. We're gonna rejoice together today. And we do this publicly because each one is declaring they're gonna follow Jesus, no turning back. So you can go ahead and be seated as we baptize today. The first one is Mildred Ortega. Mildred is joined in the tank by her fiance, Oscar. Mildred said she was going through a divorce when she found Jesus. She was 26 years old, living in Miami with her son, felt alone and rejected. At that time, her strength was dependent on herself and not Jesus, but now, she is confident in her faith and his strength. She knows that he is with her even when she cannot see it. It has been difficult and painful at times, but Jesus has been with her throughout her whole journey. Brenna Helsel is 12 years old and she's joined in a tank by her dad. Brenna was four years old when she accepted Jesus into her heart. She understood that she needed to believe in Jesus to go to heaven. She also noticed Christians that she knew seemed calm and felt that God was in control. She wanted that kind of peace too. Church was always important to her and she was very eager to sing along and praise God. She remembers humming some of those worship songs all week even though she couldn't talk yet. Now she's committed her life to Jesus and she lives every day feeling safe, knowing God has everything under control. If something does happen in her life that seems bad, she knows that everything will happen for a reason. And when things seem, dis seem disappointing, she tries to think that God is changing her direction away from trouble. She wants to get baptized to show that she has put her complete trust in Jesus. Bailey Casey is joined in the tank by her friend Charlotte. Bailey says that in 2020, everything was falling apart and she felt like she had nothing left, nothing to look forward to. It had seemed that all her hard work that she put into school and to dance was for nothing. And she needed something to look forward to every week. So she went to church and grew closer to the Lord. Before Christ, Bailey's life was dark. On July 16th, her daily devotional said, self-pity is a slimy, bottomless pit which was so true for her. She had accepted that darkness and sat in that pit of defeat. Now, her life is like the sky. There are days when it's sunshine, there are days when the sky is cloudy and even stormy. But even on those shady days, they, give her, and they may give her some doubt, but God said to Noah, I have set my rainbow in the clouds and it'll be a sign of covenant between me and the earth. The rainbow at the end of Bailey's stormy days is her love and faith in the Lord which serves as a reminder of how he pulled her out of that bottomless pit so that she could see the bright skies above her. Lexi Fontana says that she knows God, she knew God her whole life, but it wasn't until she left for college that God found her. After some time, she allowed the weight of the world to weigh on her instead of giving it to him. 
and that was such a mistake. Her life felt so empty. Now with Jesus at the center, her life is full. She feels loved and protected because she is close to Jesus. It is so good to celebrate with Change Lives today. Could you stand? I invite you to stand. We're going to continue to worship, thanking God for the work that he's doing in our hearts and in our church. Come on, let's put our hands together. We're going to celebrate what God's doing today. Amen. Just can't win the fight, I'm slow 
How many of you are thankful that your feet are set on solid ground? <laughs> oh, it's good. Thank you for leading us so well, guys. Um, just as we're in this attitude of worship and praise and faith, like I sense just an attitude of faith, I feel in my heart to take some time to pray for the situations going on in Afghanistan. Uh, very such serious situation, but we know there are people there that, um, that, that are dealing with things that probably we can't even imagine what they're going through, but we can pray. So I wanna invite you to pray, just in your own words, as you're standing there, as you're joining us online, just begin to pray for that situation. Let's lift up our voice together. So Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, and we lift up the people of Afghanistan, those who are uh, in the, what may seem like a hopeless situation, but we know that no situation is truly without hope because Jesus is alive and well. And just like we're celebrating how he's changed lives here, we know that you can change that nation by changing people's hearts and minds and turning them towards you. So God, I pray for the Christians who are there and the churches that are there. God, I pray that the, the God of revival would show up in a way there that no one can deny you're on the move. Lord, we pray for your protection around the people there. We pray for uh, the leaders who are making decisions that impact that nation, that you would give them wisdom. They would look to you. They would surrender their lives and their minds and their wills to you. And we pray in some way, God, there would be a miracle that would take place in that nation. We pray all of that in Jesus' name. Lord, I also wanna lift up the nation of Haiti to you. I thank you for... Uh, just the, the people that are there, precious people. Lord, we pray for your protection around them, still dealing with the chaos from the earthquake, God, rebuilding and trying to figure out all of that. We pray, God, that, that you would move and work in that nation. Pray for the people there, that they, many would come to know you and turn their lives towards you. And just, Lord, as we're gathered here together, our hearts are open, we're hungry for what you have for us today. I thank you for the lives that have been changed through water baptism, that declaration of faith, public faith in you. Let this be a line in the sand for them that will set a foundation for their lives into the future. So thank you for that. We give you all praise, all glory, all honor today. In Jesus' name, we all say amen. 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 Can we thank God one more time for his goodness? Mercy never fails. Love endures forever. So good to worship together. You can go ahead and be seated. And uh, to my left here is Brad Aldrich. He is our marriage and family pastor. And then Betsy Torres is our community groups pastor. And in, we are in the middle or the, the moment to be signing up for groups. And so would you share with what's going on? Absolutely. We are really, really excited that tonight is the first weekend to sign up for small groups. They are going to be starting the week of September 12th, so only a couple of weeks away as school's getting going, as everything's happening. We're gonna have groups, and we have groups for all of you. And I know this last year, year and a half has been tough. Some of you have tried groups before. Some made it through COVID. Some didn't and had some tough experiences. But we are back coming together, and we have groups for everybody. And we really want you to come together and find that community, find a place where you can continue to grow. So we have two different types of groups. Some are community groups and some are what we call equip groups. Betsy, tell us a little bit about what a community group is. Thank you, Brad. Yes, groups are a huge part of Worship Center. And community groups are just smaller groups of um, people that gather together between 8 to 10 people um, to do life together and do intentional community um, with one another. And one another is in the Bible, like a, a lot of times, right? And we see, like, love uh, one another, serve one another, encourage one another. And we do that best when we um, are intentional about being in community. Um, life is not meant to be walked alone, um, and there's so much truth to that statement. When we look at the Bible, we see that from the beginning of time, it's like, let us make mankind. Uh, it's not good for man to be alone, so he made Adam a, a wife. <laughs> and then in Psalms, he sets the lonely in family. So we are convinced that um, we're not created to do life alone. And we can experience this by doing community groups. So we are all on a journey, and it's so much better when we do it together. 
Absolutely. So community groups meet throughout the week all around Lancaster County. Uh, we have lots of places for you. We also have these groups called equip groups because we know sometimes there's stuff in life that we need to learn more about. So whether it be faith or finances or something in your family, there's lots of different places to grow. So those groups usually meet here um, at the church and we have many of them throughout the week. We have a lot of them meeting Monday evenings. Monday evenings is kind of a special family equip group night and we have groups like Reengage Marriage. We have groups like Smart Step Family and so many more that are happening here on Monday evenings. And we're gonna have childcare available for your kids from birth through fourth grade. We would love you to come and check them out. There's so many different things. It doesn't matter what you're looking for, what stage of life you're in, we've got something for you. So we really encourage you to come and check it out. How do they find out more? So on the screen, you're going to see a QR code. Basically, if you don't know how to do that, it's open your cameras. You can do it right now. You open your cameras. You scan up there to that QR code, and you will receive. You will see a link pop up. With that, oh, and I, by the way, um, try to do it very quickly because pastor's going to preach, and, you know, we don't want to interrupt too much <laughs> to get too distracted. <laughs> Um, but that QR code is also going to be at our connections right outside each connection room. You're going to see it on a stand. And also, we will be happy to meet you personally in connections rooms, whichever one. And also outside on Main Street. We also have at the ends um, of East and West uh, entrances, we will have people there to help you out. Or you can go on worshipcenter.org slash group finder for those of you that are online or you guys, if you guys can't do it now, you can do it later. Don't miss it. There's lots of groups available. They are going to fill up. So come and find us today. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, leading this area to you and your team. So let me just say um, groups at Worship Center is our primary place of discipleship. So if you're not in a group, would you prayerfully consider taking that step? All right, and Brad, would you pray for us? Absolutely. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you have brought us each one here today. And Lord, we know that you have knit us together as a family focused towards you. Lord Jesus, I know there are people here today who don't know where their connections are, don't feel like they're connected to anybody. And I, Lord, I ask that you would guide and direct them into a place that they can find a group of people that can come together and grow together. Lord, we know that we're not on this journey alone and that you have asked us to bring people around us to continue to challenge us, to continue to help us to grow and develop as we are walking in this journey towards you. So I thank you, Lord, that you are guiding those things, that you've opened the doors for us to have that possibility. And Lord Jesus, I pray a blessing over each one of the community group and small group leaders throughout this church. Lord, give them wisdom Lord, give them just the abundance ability to welcome the new people that will be joining them. And thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather together to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you both for being here. Appreciate it. Can we, can we thank them? All right. Well, are you ready for God's word today? Well, it's always an honor for me to bring it. Would you stand to prepare our hearts. You know, a sermon, as you hear me say, a sermon is not a TED Talk, right? We know it's not a TED Talk. TED Talks are good, but this is not a TED Talk. A sermon is a collision between the Word of God, the Spirit of God, and a hungry soul. And I sense hunger today. Are you hungry? Yes. If spiritually hungry and physically hungry a little bit. <laughs> Well, we can wait a little till we eat, right? Let's eat God's word first. Uh, so I'm gonna dig into Nehemiah chapter two. I'm gonna read verses one through eight and then a short passage in Ephesians. Let's uh, let God's word speak to us. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. 
I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. Then the king with the queen sitting beside him asked me, how long will your journey take and when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. I also said to him, if it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of Trans-Euphrates so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. And may I have a letter to Asap, keeper of the royal park, so he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence I will occupy. And then Nehemiah wraps this whole section off by saying this, because the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my request. Now I wanna jump to Ephesians chapter three, verses 20 and 21. The apostle Paul wrote this in the first century to the church and it still speaks to us today. He writes this, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever, amen. So I wanna talk today from the subject that serves as my title, more than we imagine more than we imagine. Do you believe that God can do more than we imagine? If you believe that, I want you just to say this. Say, our God is able to do more than we ask, think, or imagine. Amen. Lord, have your way today. In Jesus' name, amen. You can have a seat, and let's dig into this passage. more than we imagine. You know, imagination is the ability to picture what is actually not present. It, we've been created by God. He's given us this ability called imagination, and it's this special ability to see what actually our senses don't experience. So imagination is the key to innovation. And you can develop your imagination. Imagination can be developed by reading, reading a good story. That can develop and nurture your imagination. Imagination can be developed by conversation. If you've ever been in a good conversation with someone who asks good questions, that can develop your imagination to picture what is not actually present. Imagination can be developed by uh, building or, or creating something. Imagination can be uh, restored by rest and recreation. That's why it's important to unplug from our regular responsibilities. But there's one other thing that I have noticed that can develop imagination, and it's this word, desperation. When we're desperate. And I don't know if your phone does this, but uh, on our smartphones, they actually know how to bring up pictures from the past that in some way have to do with uh, what's going on in your current life. So we're in the process, or just in the process of moving our two older kids down to college, and a couple weeks ago, Kelly had this picture of Ethan from about 2012, just about eight or nine years ago, when he was 10 years old, that kind of made us a little bit reflective. And I wanna show you this picture, it's a very important picture. It's kind of blurry, but I want you to see what's happening here. Um, in this moment, again, he's about 10 years old, he really wanted a ping pong table. And at that time, we didn't have, uh, we chose not to spend the money on a ping pong table. We didn't have, really have a place for it. And so here's what Ethan did. He, if you can see this, uh, he duct taped a marker here and here, 
and then put a string across on our little kitchen table, this is about half the size of a regular ping pong table, and then he got a journal to use as a paddle, and he's playing ping pong, I'm standing over here, and we played ping pong on our kitchen table. Desperation (laughs) develops your imagination. Now, he could have just sat in the corner and complained and said, you know, why can't my parents buy me a ping pong table? It's not fair. But his imagination was the key to innovation. God can do more than we imagine. If you're watching online, I want you to put that in the chat if you believe it, that God is able to do more than we imagine. So we've been given an imagination to use to picture what is actually not present. This brings us to the story of Nehemiah. In chapter one, Nehemiah showed us the importance of prayer. We talked about that last week. If you weren't here, if you didn't get a chance to listen to that message, I would encourage you to go back and listen to it. Chapter one was all about Nehemiah being moved with compassion, the importance of prayer. Chapter two is all about the importance of action. Imagination actually should help us take that step of action. It's what motivated, it's what showed Nehemiah. He was able to picture something that was not actually present. Uh, Chapter two is about taking a step, overcoming fear, overcoming insecurity, stepping out of our comfort zones, even while you're afraid. And so I want us to learn four things from Nehemiah that I think this story is so relevant for us today. What we can learn from Nehemiah about moving in action, taking a step when we, after we've been praying about something, what is the next step? Starts with alignment with God, gives us confidence in God, which produces clarity of vision and leads to our assignment from God. So we're gonna go through each one of those. So if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Number one, write down this word, alignment. Alignment with God. Prayer aligns our heart with God's will. Prayer aligns your life with God's will. This is the shortest point I'm gonna have today, but it's the most important. This is the foundation for what we learned about Nehemiah, and it's the foundation for us today. See, when when Nehemiah heard about the the walls of Jerusalem being uh, burnt down, broken down, the gates uh, burnt down, and the people living in disgrace, he didn't get angry about it. Uh, He didn't turn a blind eye to it. He said, well, I hope everything works out for them. He prayed, and his prayer consisted of of praise, repentance, and a request to God. And that time of prayer actually aligned aligned his life with God's will. And he prayed for four months, from the month of Kislev to the month of Nisan. Commentaries tell us that's about a four-month span. It took less than two months to rebuild the wall. So that tells me Nehemiah prayed about something for four months that only took two months to accomplish. Nehemiah prayed four months about something that took two months to accomplish. You know, I have a hard time waiting for four days when Amazon's late. (laughs) Nehemiah prayed for four months about something that only took two months to accomplish. I wonder, what is our commitment to prayer? When we see something in the world that needs to be rebuilt, needs to be completed, needs to be worked at, what is our commitment to prayer? Because prayer assures us that our heart is aligned with God's will. When we experience alignment with God, that produces confidence, number two, confidence in him. Nehemiah had the, 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 the wisdom to know when to wait, know when to ask, and know when to act. Great example for us. He was a wise leader. Wise leaders know when to wait, They know when to ask and they know when to act. And so I can imagine when Nehemiah, over this time of four months where he's praying about it and he feels this this burden for his, the city of Jerusalem, you know, every day, probably when he stepped foot into his job, he was just a cupbearer. He wasn't, he wasn't a king. He wasn't a construction expert. He was a cupbearer. Cupbearers know about food and wine. 
And so every day when he brought the food and the wine to the king, I wonder what his process was. You know, is this the day? Will there be an opportunity? Is there some step I can take? He knew when to wait, he knew when, knew when to ask, and he knew when to act. And finally, four months after he learned about the news of Jerusalem, he shows up and something about his countenance got the king's attention. And the king asked him, why are you sad? Now, how did Nehemiah respond? Nehemiah did not say, well, it's about time you noticed. You know, I've been sad the last four months. Can't believe you waited till now. No, Nehemiah was very afraid. You know why? Because you don't show up in the king's court like Debbie Downer. That's, a, that's means to getting uh, kicked out of the king's court and most likely executed. So everybody's always in a good mood when you're around the king, no matter what's going on in private. But the king asked him, why, why is your heart sad? And wh- how did Nehemiah respond? He took a deep breath, said, I was very afraid, but I said, long live the king. He took that step even while he was afraid. You know, sometimes when we accomplish something for God, we cannot wait for fear to disappear. Sometimes you gotta just do it afraid. You guys gotta take that step. And so Nehemiah, he gives this brilliant answer. He says, long long lives the king. And then he answers the king's question with a question. He said, why should I not be sad when the city, my city, the city of my ancestors, lies in ruin and his people are in disgrace. What was he doing? He was creating this moment where the king would have empathy for him. Understand that Nehemiah was not upset over something personal. It's not like he was having a bad day. Nehemiah brought the king into that situation and and helped him understand what it's like, what it would feel like if your walls, the walls of your city are broken down. So the king understood that. The king knew it. a city with no walls makes you vulnerable, makes you defenseless. And he understood. And the king then said, what is it you want? And that sets up Nehemiah to request. That sets up Nehemiah to take this step. And the reason he, had, he was ready is because his confidence was in God. His confidence in God helped him have courage to respond to the king. And our confidence in God today, when we have our confidence in God, it will give us courage to either wait, ask, or act. That brings us to that scripture in Ephesians 3. God is able to do immeasurably more, exceedingly abundantly more than we can ask, think, or imagine. So he's given us this imagination, yet God says, I can do even more than what you imagine. But it doesn't just stop there. It's according to his power at work within us. So where does his work start? Within us. Paul says something similar in Philippians 2.13. He says, for God is working in who? You. God is working in you, God is working in me. And how is he working? Giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. There's that word power again. God's power at work within us then gives us the ability or gives God, we see that God has the ability to do more than we ask, think, or imagine. So his power at work within us is first. What is that power? That's ability, it's strength, it means the God of angel armies, he's on your side. And it's that same power that raised Christ from the dead, lives in you, lives in me, that resurrection power that we can walk in. It's that confidence that we uh, experience when we're aligned with God. This is the confidence that Nehemiah had. So the king said, what is it you want? And how did Nehemiah respond? He took a deep breath. He said, if it pleases the king, could you send me back to Jerusalem to rebuild the city? That takes guts. I hope we understand how much courage that took as a cupbearer who really has no authority in the king's court other than to make sure that the food and the wine aren't poisoned to say, would you release me from my responsibilities here to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the wall? The king and the queen, they were sitting there and they said, okay, how long are you gonna be gone? He told him, we don't know how long it was, but he told them, and the king's like, okay. And Nehemiah said, and 
Can you uh, write letters to all of the governors around so that as we travel through, we will find safety and protection? The king's like, okay. Nehemiah's like, and can you contact ASAP, the, the guy who's in charge of all the timber, all the wood, and could you have him send me timbers for us to rebuild the city and the gate and a house for myself to live in? And by the way, I need a security detail to keep me safe. And Nehemiah writes, because of the gracious hand of my God upon me, the king granted my request. Alignment with God gives us confidence in him, even when we're afraid, even when we're walking into unknown situation. When we find our confidence in God, what that brings and what that produces is number three, it, bring, it gives us clarity of vision. Confidence in God gives us clarity of vision. And clarity of vision uh, answers that all-important question, why? Why am I doing this? Clarity of vision answers the question, why? It's a question that we've asked since we were children. If you're parents, you have young kids, you know you did not have to teach your children to ask the question, why? Right, they just ask it. Why do I have to come inside? Why do I have to take a bath? Why do I have to go to bed? Why do we have to, you know, why can't I eat more snacks? And at some point, parents, you know the answer that it comes to. When that goes on long enough, what's the answer that shuts that all down? Because I said so. Which isn't a great answer to the question why. But why is a very important question to answer for each of us to answer. Uh, a number of years ago, about 10 years ago, Simon Sinek wrote a book called Start With Why. And the hypothesis in that book is really that he said people truly won't buy into a product or an idea or a movement or a service until they understand the why behind it. That's the whole idea of the book. It's a good book. Um, and I want to give a, a couple examples of this. People really won't buy into a product or a service or a movement or an idea until they understand why. Now, let's get an example um, have, you ever, have you ever heard of the shoe brand Nike? Have you heard of that one? Okay, small little shoe company. Uh, here's Nike's why. This is right from their website. We deliver innovative products, experiences, and services. What's their why? To inspire athletes. So when you lace, on, lace up a, a pair of Nikes, the point of that, all of the research that went into that, the comfort and the innovation and, and the experience that you have is to inspire you as an athlete. Not guaranteeing that you're gonna be a good athlete, but they want you to make you feel like you're a good athlete. And last year in 2020, um, their sales were right around $40 billion. So it must be working. How about this story? Have you ever heard of this little place called Chick-fil-A? Uh, Chick-fil-A, and again, this isn't about Chick-fil-A or Nike, but these are just examples. Here's Chick-fil-A's why, their, their mission, right from their website. To glorify God by being a faithful steward of all that is entrusted to us. To have a positive influence on all who come in contact with Chick-fil-A. And do you notice there's nothing there about chicken? <laughs> we don't even know, I mean, if you just saw this, you, you wouldn't even know what industry they're in. Their reason for existence is to have a positive influence on all who interact with their restaurant, their store. So whether you're in the executive suite or you're serving chicken sandwiches and, and the customer says thank you and you're say, you say, my pleasure, you are having a positive, that's the whole point of this, to have a positive influence on all who come in contact with Chick-fil-A. So you know why do they exist. If they decide, you know what, we're done selling chicken sandwiches, let's sell, let's sell hamburgers instead. Their mission would remain the same. They've got their why down. What is the why of worship center? Why do we exist as a church? You wanna know? Worship center exists to help people follow Jesus and find purpose in him. We do not exist just so we can have worship gatherings like this. We don't exist just so we can do small groups and have all these programs. The reason why we are here is we want to help as many people as possible follow Jesus and find their purpose in him. The reason why, if we accomplish this, 
When a person chooses to follow Jesus, it impacts every area of their life. When they surrender their life to Jesus and understand how Jesus walked on the earth and how he made decisions, it begins to influence how a person will interact with other people, how they'll love others the way Jesus loved them. It will impact, if you're married, it will impact your your marriage. If you're single, it will impact your relationships. It will impact how you manage money. It will impact how you how you um, function on a job or your place of employment. It should influence every area of your life. So what we have to figure out as a church is what do we do and how do we do it when it comes to helping people follow Jesus and find purpose in him? We always go back to this. This is why we exist as a church. That influences what we do. So we do small groups here. Why do we do sermon-based groups? You wanna know why? We do sermon-based groups because it is our primary place of discipleship, and when people discuss God's word, it leads to discovery, because we learn from one another. And that discovery then gives, us, gives you the decision to understand um, what does following Jesus mean? How do I follow Jesus? So when we get together in groups, yes, there should be, it should be relational, and it should be caring for one another, and there should be good support for one another, and you should always have good food at a a group when your group meets. But the primary reason we do groups here is so that you have a place where you are discussing God's word. You're taking God's word from the message, from the sermon, and saying, okay, how do we put this into real life? How do we apply this to real life? And you begin to grow. So group leaders, if you are a group leader, I wanna implore you, be disciplined to always spend time discussing God's word. We need that, all of us need that. I can't wait for my group to start again in a couple weeks because it is a place for me to be with a couple other guys and we discuss God's word. We pray together, we encourage each other, but we will get into God's word and grow. Why do I do sermons? You wanna know why I do sermons? Because I've got this strong, deep desire. My why for sermons is to help you understand what it means to follow Jesus. To help you engage with God's word. So you're not just taking my word for it, but you're getting into God's word for yourself so that you can discover how does my faith intersect with real life. That's my why for a sermon. That's why I put time into study and preparation and I try to communicate it and you know, to be as effective as I can be, to as do as good of a job as I can do because I want you to understand what it means to follow Jesus, engage with his words so you discover how does all of this apply to real life? What is my why for being a dad? I'm not just a dad. My why for being a dad isn't just because I got Kelly pregnant a number of years ago. I have to have more of a why than that. My why for being a dad, and Kelly and I, our, our desire as parents, our why for being parents is to raise independent, responsible adults who love God and love people. Just that simple. So for me as a dad, I want to live my life in a way that encourages that so that they we do the very best I can. There's no guarantees on it. You might be thinking, well, that's probably easy because you're a pastor. It's probably easy to do that. Let me just say, um, there's an interesting dynamic when you're a pastor and a dad. And for me, what I want to be so um, committed to is to make sure that what I say publicly lines up with what my kids see privately. And dads, let me just tell you, I would encourage you to have that same commitment. It's easy to look good. When you have a microphone, you're standing up in front of people, it's easy to look good. But I want what I say publicly and how I behave publicly to line up with what my kids and my family sees privately. And dads, I'd encourage you to have that same level of commitment. You will be amazed at the impact you will have on your life when you live out your faith at home. So what is your why? Do you have clarity of vision for your life? Do you have a why? If you're in business, you're a business leader, do you have a why for why you're personally in business? 
Do you have a why for what you're doing? Do you have a why for parenting? Do you have a why for every and any area of your life of significance? When you have that, whatever stage of life you're in, that clarity of vision will give you a reason to get up every day. It'll help you see that there is a reason why God has you on this earth in 2021. There's a reason for why you're here. That clarity of vision answers the question why. But you also can't ignore the facts, right? You gotta deal with what's real life, what you really are facing. And this is why the story of Nehemiah, I just love this story so much because he did not ignore, he didn't just have this picture of how rebuilding the wall was gonna go and it's probably just gonna you know, be very easy to mobilize people. No, he eventually travels to Jerusalem. He gets the letters, he gets all of that that the king assured him he would have and he gets there with his security detail and all the people that he interacted with. The first night, while they're all asleep, he sneaks out and he inspects the wall for himself. And he wanted to see exactly what he had to deal with. And I wanna read, jump down to verse 16 in Nehemiah 2. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we're in. So he dealt with facts. He dealt with the reality. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. But his clarity of vision came through right here. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. And they replied, let us start rebuilding. Not not, um, well, Nehemiah, why don't you do it? No, they, they said, they, they saw it too. Let us start. These are the same people. Most of them already lived there. We're living in this, these conditions. But they needed somebody to paint a picture of what was not actually present. So the people said, let us start rebuilding. And they began this good work. And that clarity of vision gave them their assignment from God. Number four. Assignment. God has an assignment for you. Nehemiah's assignment was to coordinate a plan and consolidate the people. Consolidation. You know, consolidation is taking many parts that are separate and unifying them in one particular force. And he did that. And then he began to assign tasks. He was the leader in this, but then he began to assign very important tasks. And if you read chapter three in Nehemiah, you begin to see how this plan unfolds. Brilliant plan. The people who were living there, he had assigned them to build the part of the wall that was in front of their house. So they took pride in their work because they were gonna see that section of the wall every day that they got up. So they built that section in front of their home. And you, if you read through chapter three, it would say, so-and-so built this part of the wall. Next to them, so-and-so built this part of the wall. Next to them, so-and-so built this part of the wall. And you begin to see how Nehemiah consolidated the people to get this great work done. And God wants the same thing. He is consolidating people. God is not just interested in assembling a crowd. He wants to mobilize a team, mobilize an army. Jesus did not build his church just to be a crowd of spectators. Jesus built his church to be a team of participators, involved, getting off the sidelines and getting involved. You have been given an assignment from God. In preparation for this, story and studying through Nehemiah, I read this book called God Help Me Rebuild This Broken World, or God Help Me Rebuild My Broken World. I think it's This Broken World by Dr. Michael Youssef. And it's a very thought-provoking book. One of the questions that I found in this book, and I love thought-provoking books because it's interesting. The older I get, it feels like the less I know. Have you ever had that experience? The longer you've been a parent, it seems like the less you know. The longer I've been studying the Bible, it seems like, man, I just have so much more to learn. 
So I love reading thought-provoking books, and he makes this statement, really it's a question, and it's a question each of us should ask ourselves. Not ask somebody else, but ask ourselves. Here's the question he asks. He said, if every person in our church were just like me, what kind of church would this be? In other words, if every person in our church engaged in the life of the church, engaged in a small group, engaged in God's word, gave generously, financially, if everyone did those practices like me, what kind of church would this be? If every person shared Jesus with their neighbor like me, what kind of church would this be? How many people would be coming to Christ? You see why it's thought-provoking, challenging, encouraging? But just imagine if the church was made up of people who were committed to get their assignment from God and make a difference right where they are. Imagine a church filled with people who took Jesus, his teachings, took God at his word, put him into practice in their life, in their homes. Imagine how homes would be impacted. If every person in our church were just like me, what kind of church would this be? See, I just love our church. And I see people from all different seasons of life. I see people who are engaged in all kinds of different industries, have so much unique gifts, I mean, so many unique gifts and abilities. But in order to build God's kingdom here on the earth, and Jesus said, I wanna build my church. He did not just build, he was not just building something so that we could have a place to be spectators. He wanted to mobilize people. You have an assignment. You have been given a, an assignment from God. Some of you have been called to be like Nehemiah. You have call, been called to be high capacity leaders. You have been called to take a step, go into high risk, uncertainty, do it afraid, and know how you have the know how to consolidate people and to inspire people with vision. Some of you are called to be workers, helping rebuild. Some of you are called to be moms. Some of you are called to be dads. Some of you are called to be farmers. Some of you are called to sell real estate. Some of you are called to be in construction. Some of you are called to be in the medical field, to be doctors and nurses. Some of you are called to be pastors. Work in a church, be part of administrating the function of a church. Some of you are called to be artists, writing books, writing music. Some of you are called to be engineers, inventing, solving problems. Some of you are called to be builders. Some of you are called to be landscapers. Some of you are called to be right where you are, to work in stores, to work in restaurants, to, to create environments to be a positive influence that will point people to God. What is your assignment from God? Do you receive that today? All right, let's pray. God, thank you so much for your word. God, would you take this sermon God, the words that were spoken from your word, I, they're like seeds, so I pray that they would just settle in our hearts. God, I pray for those who may feel discouraged today. Maybe some people feel like they lost their why. I thank you for your word. I thank you for our Holy Spirit that works together to renew, rebuild, refresh, reignite. God, 
God, would you reignite in us a desire? You said in your word, you give the, you, you give the power and the desire. You work in us to give us the power and the desire to do what pleases you. God, would you do your work in our hearts? I thank you for it. In Jesus' name. If you're here today and you've never made a decision to follow Jesus, if you're watching online and you might say, what does it mean to follow Jesus because if somebody lived in the first century, how do you follow someone that's not here? We get to know Jesus by reading his word, reading and understanding how did Jesus view people? How did he love people? What did he do? How did he live his life? And then we follow his example. He took up his cross, laid down his life, because he loved other people and he loved God, his father. So I don't know what it is for you, but I don't know where you are in your understanding of faith, but I'm, the step to follow Jesus is a simple step of surrender. Jesus said to Peter, one of the disciples, he says, follow me and I will teach you how to fish for people. Peter was a fisherman. Another example is he went to Matthew, the tax collector, and he went right into his tax collecting office and he said, follow me. And Matthew ends up writing a gospel, a story in the life of, of Jesus. So it starts with that step to surrender. It's like, I want to follow you with my whole heart. No turning back. If you're ready to make that decision, repent of your sins, receive forgiveness for your sins, I want to lead you in a prayer. It's a simple prayer. But it's a prayer. It's a starting point. It sets you on a path. You're ready to do that. Would you just repeat this after me? And we can all say, just so nobody's praying alone, would you just say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus. I believe he is the Son of God. I believe he died on the cross for me. And I believe he rose from the dead for me. I repent of my sins. I receive forgiveness for my sins. And I choose to follow Jesus with my whole heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we thank God for the power of salvation? Well, I just sense that's changing our hearts, encouraging. If you prayed that prayer for the first time or if you know you needed to recommit your life to Jesus, if you're here in the room, would you just put your hands straight up in the air, unashamed of that decision? The ushers have a gift for you. It has a Bible and some other material in it. It's really our way of walking with you. I see a couple hands. If you're watching online, would you just text the word prayer to the number on the screen? We'd love to follow up with you any way that we can. If it's for prayer, if you have some questions, please don't hesitate. Reach out to us. For those of you who raised your hands, made that decision, I want to invite you after the service to stop by the connections rooms to my right to, and, or left at the uh, exits of the auditorium. We have a great team of people in there that would love to talk with you and pray with you if you'd like. Please stop by there after we dismiss. We'd love to walk with you. Because this journey of faith is not meant to be walked alone. So I encourage you to stop by there. All right. Well, are you thankful for God's word today? I pray that it encourages you. Before you go, if I wanted to just um, give you an opportunity to give financially in our regular tithes and offerings. You know, when you give financially here, it really just allows us as a church to be a storehouse, to be a place where we can meet uh, felt needs both here in our church, in our community, and all around the world. Uh, it allows us to, you know, pay for the light bill, allows us to pay for the expenses, for the administrating, all the things that we do here. So your generosity and your faithfulness in giving really is a way for you to be part of that. So I want to say thank you for your generosity. If you'd like to give, you can see how to do that on the screen or at, you can give in the boxes uh, at each entrance. But your giving, your generosity, allows us to be a church that is part of building the kingdom of God. It really is. It really is that simple. So thank you for that. And when we give, when we're generous, uh, it's a way to live with an open hand and say, God, I trust you with my finances. So I just want to pray a blessing over you as we're in this time moment of giving and just pray for you and your finances as well. Lord, thank you for the truth that you are our provider. It's not the economy. It's not even our jobs or our businesses. 
you are our provider and you use all kinds of different ways to provide for us. So we thank you for that. We trust you. And Lord, I pray for those who may be experiencing financial need right now. I pray you give them wisdom, peace, and courage to know where you're leading, knowing that you'll provide for them. So we thank you for that. Pray all of it in Jesus' name. We all said, amen. Amen. You can all stand. So good being together today. If you need prayer, please feel free to come forward. We have a prayer team that we'd love to pray with you. And if you're new to Worship Center or newer to Worship Center, make sure you stop by Connections. Or if you're looking to sign up for a group or get some more information, uh, stop by Connections as well. Great team of people there that love to help you get connected. All right, well, have a great week. Let's stay connected this week, and we'll see you here next weekend.